they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Thank you. Thank you. So, so good to be with you. And welcome to Charles. Great to have Charles with us here today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Particular welcome to you wherever you're joining us today. So good to be with you. And today we're coming to the end of this series where we've been, really, we've been praying a prayer for the last few weeks. And we've been praying, God, take us back. Not, not don't take us back just to 18 months ago to the beginning of January 2020, but take us back 2,000 years to the time when people had just experienced the death and resurrection of Jesus and when you poured out your Holy Spirit upon those new believers and upon that church. And we've been saying, God, what you did then, would you do it again and would you do it in us? Because we believe the same Holy Spirit who was at work then, he can be in work in us too. Now, today, as we come to the end of this series, we're going to be looking at one particular scripture again. It's right at the end of the reading you just saw, where we read this, it says this, praising God, this is describing the church, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Two things Charles and I want to unpack with you today, which I believe God wants to release in your life and my life in greater measure. The first is joy. How many of you would like some more joy in your life, an increase? Well, I believe God wants to release that to you and me today, but also an increase in a sense of purpose, that sense that you and I, we were made for something significant, and we can, te- we can connect into the eternal purposes of God. So we're going to dive into those two subjects today, and I'm going to begin, to be honest, I say we, it's actually Charles is going to be doing most of the work. So... Charles, the first thing we see, I think, here is joy. We're going to talk about joy. You see in verse 47 in the the NLT, it says, they ate their meals with great joy, praising God. And I love that. Praise is the overflow of a heart filled with joy. So Charles, my first question to you is two things, really. How would you describe this great joy? What is it? And second, where does it come from? Thank you so much, Simon and uh... Uh, we thank God for this opportunity. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is Liverpool beating Man City. <laughs> happiness is Man City not winning the Champions League so that uh, Pastor Dave can come and tell me, Charles, we did it. Nah, it, 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 that, that's happiness. Um, joy is so much more. Joy is something irrepressible. It's within, it comes from your heart. It flows out and it's not circumstantial. It doesn't depend on what's happening, whether it's summer, whether it's winter, whether it's autumn, whether the trees have leaves or not, or or whether they're withering or whatever the flowers are blooming. Joy flows at every time. Joy flows out of your heart. Let's not forget one thing. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, Paul writes out and tells us the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't say fruits, he says the fruit. So joy flows from the heart. And we can see the disciples. Look at them. They, they, they had an encounter with the Holy Spirit in the beginning of Acts chapter 2. And we see joy, the fruit of the Spirit, walking in their lives. When we look through the passage of scriptures in Acts chapter 2, we see that it just wasn't the fruit of the Spirit. There's so many things that are happening. Look at them. They were devoted to the teachings and to fellowship. That would have needed joy to fuel it out. They, they gave generously, willingly and cheerfully aspects of joy. They lived lives full of awe of God. That's joy in itself. 
The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 that you will draw with joy from the wells of salvation. I can imagine the disciples having become born again, having met with Jesus, and now they've seen Jesus go to the cross and he's risen and, and suddenly he's alive in them and they're born again and everything. And they're looking and saying, wow, this is what he talked about. This is what God was talking about. And they were drawing from that experience from the wells of salvation. Let's not forget, Simon, the Bible says, Jesus said, if you believe in me, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You need to understand. If you're going to clap, clap your hands to the king of kings. <laughs> you need to understand that God wants you to draw from the rivers that from with joy. If, if you've ever seen a, a well, an image of a well, and there's a bucket that's it, it's not a teaspoon, it's a bucket that goes down to bring the water that's required for your livelihood. Joy is that bucket. Joy is that bucket that brings your salvation, that brings your healing, that brings your promotion, that brings your well-being. Joy is that bucket. It can't be a teaspoon. It can't be changed. If you change the size of that bucket and decide today it's going to be a teaspoon that I'm going to bring out to bring my healing and this, you're only going to get a teaspoon of life flowing out. So please, get the bucket of joy. Come on. Oh, I love it. Here's a man, he's got a big bucket, I want to tell you. It's, um, I, know, I know Charles well, and one of the things that always strikes me about you, Charles, is if I'm with you for a few moments, I start to feel an overflow of joy. You are someone who exudes that. But I also know you well enough to know this last year has been a particularly tough year. It's not been an easy year, it's been a tough one. I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us a story that illustrates both how Joy has such substance in the midst of very challenging circumstances. I mean, like we all, like someone has said, like we all, we, we all have really can say that the last 18 months have been very, very tough. So in December, I get a phone call telling me my dad has been taken into hospital. He's had a stroke, basically. Mm. I called someone and told someone we need to pray. We'd been praying for his healing. He'd been having a kidney dialysis for two years before that. And we had just consistently been praying, all of us just trusting God, that God, you will do something. 48 hours after I get the phone call, um, while I'm trying to arrange a PCR test and everything else, and everybody in Cambridge prayer team, leadership all over, I've told someone, please tell everybody to pray hard. 48 hours later, I get a phone call, and um, he's gone. Wow. Got on a plane, and I'm wondering, is this life? Where are you, God? Where are you? We've prayed, we've fasted, we've waited on you. As I'm flying at 40,000 feet, wondering, tossing and turning, what am I going to tell my mom? What am I going to tell my brother? What am I going to tell my siblings, my, my, my sisters? They're, they're all looking up to me like, is this God? Is this how God works? What am I going to tell my wife? Yes, she's here with me, but what am I going to tell her? In that stillness and as waiting and just wondering and tossing and turning, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 to 19 came to life. Though the fig tree failed to blossom, mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. even if your prayer is not answered, yet I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation, my God. I got up on that seat and I began to dance, my God. I will rejoice, why? I'll give you thanks. Daddy gave his life to Jesus many years ago. He had been serving you, so I know he's marching in heaven. He's joined the cloud of witnesses looking at me, so guess what, boy? Run this race with joy. I was ready for it. By the time I touched down, I was ready. Run through the troop, leap over every wall, because I had an ounce of divine joy that was peddling and pushing me more than ever. Wow. 
just, just for a moment, I want to say, I know for many of you, uh, this year has been a tough year. There have been incredibly difficult things that have happened. And just, just like for Charles, we, we want to pray two things for you. One is that you will know the comfort of God. Mm. You know, right in the midst of this season, there's something about knowing his presence and his goodness where all the questions don't get answered, but his presence changes it. Mm. But also, like what's happened for Charles, you'll experience that joy that doesn't make any sense, but comes straight from the heart of God himself. But Charles, just just coming back to you, um, the thing that strikes me about you, even just listening to that powerful story, is how you've cultivated joy by certain habits and practices. I wonder if you could just share one or two with us that that really make a difference for you for for joy. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. It's, it's difficult to just share one and two, really. I'm going to be disciplined here, but I might just maybe go down to three or four. I mean, when, when you read through the book of Acts chapter two, look at the example, the template that they offer us. They were devoted. It takes devotion to maintain joy. Devotion to God, to the fellowship, to, to the teachings that you receive. It takes you cultivating that devotion. It takes you coming to that place of asking yourself, is my life a life of awe, full of the awe of God? Joy won't just flow when you're just living carelessly. It comes when you're living that life that's in awe of God. Joy is in that place when you know that you're giving to the needy and to the gospel cheerfully, willingly, knowing that, you know what? I'm not giving to a man. I'm giving to the work of God. Joy is something I made up a choice. I mean, we, for 18 months, we kept having daily briefings at five. You would hear so much of what's happening. And my wife and I made a choice that we will have a daily briefing with God where we will confess the word of God over ourselves. You go to the prayer shield and you will find that in the prayer, in the Lord's prayer, there is an element where Pastor Dave put confessions that you make. I am accepted in the beloved, whether I'm quarantined or in isolation or living in my home by myself, I am accepted in the beloved. So confessions have to be made. Yes, a life of prayer. Yes, um, being walking with the Holy Spirit and continually giving yourself to him and asking him, fill me again, fill me afresh. Living a life of praise. Don't just come to sing praise when Keith is leaving us in such lovely songs with Simon and the entire team and everybody else and Rue over in Cambridge and Chris and everybody else. Don't just come to sing on Sundays. Sing every day. Wake up in the morning. I know maybe they said you can't sing but you know what? Your insurance company won't mind you singing. Open your mouth and sing. David praised God seven times a day, Simon. Seven times. That means he was deliberate. This is a king. He was deliberate to pose and say, God, I give you praise. And lastly, and this is so important in this season, Simon, public praise. It's so important. It's so important because there is something you see in the Bible. The disciples were all together. Peter wasn't in his palace. John wasn't in his mansion. James wasn't in his penthouse. Martha and Mary weren't cooking in a kitchen when the Holy Spirit came. The Bible says they were together in one place. Public praise brings a move of God. There's an outbreak. You read the Bible, it's full of examples that when they were together, God moved. Acts chapter 4, the disciples, Peter and John had been in jail and when they came out, they were together and again they prayed in Acts chapter 4 verse 29. You see the Holy Spirit come down and shake the building. There is a shaking that takes place when we are all together. We will fight fear when we are together. Not just when you're by yourself. I was sharing with Simon some time ago and he was asking me, why do you love church? And I was telling him, Simon, I read a story once of, of how you, if, if you took coal out of the fire after a period of time, it goes out. But when you come together, when we come together, it doesn't matter what you have, what I have, what we all have brings about a fire that turns around. I thought about this the other day, Simon, and I said, wow. My wife and I, when we came into Kingsgate, I didn't know anybody in Cambridge except my wife. 
My life today is so different. Why? Because I have attending church and praising God together. I've made new friends. Friends we go out for movies. Friends who're inviting me for barbecues. Friends we're laughing about. Friends who today are waiting to see whether, whether I'm going to be singing It's Coming Home. <laughs> Don't worry, you missed that. Those who are watching England know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chell. That's so good. And isn't it great that we're in this season, we're both online, in person, we're together, but we're also together with people right across different cities. It's just amazing. Charles, we need to make a turn. We've talked about a revival of joy. Let's talk about a revival of purpose. One of the things that really strikes me when you read this passage is you see these people, they're filled with joy. They're so excited at what God is doing in their life. It spills over to the people around them. You know, we read, this is the last bit really of the whole section we've been at and it says this, the Lord added to their number daily, Mm. daily, those who are being saved. I mean, imagine that, Kingsgate, being part of a church where God is so at work in our lives that people cannot help but talk about the good things that Jesus has done and is doing and out of that, every single day of the week, people are saying yes to Jesus. So Charles, I I find when I read this, it's both inspiring and challenging. Why do you think these people were so full of that purpose? Wow. Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus tells them, don't live here. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You're gonna have the power to become my witnesses. But before that, there were conversations that took place in the book of John. You see, the disciples had been with Jesus for three years and then suddenly Jesus turns a conversation to them and tells them, I'm going to be leaving you guys. And the guys are wondering, hold on, we've seen you break, uh, do miracles. We've seen Lazarus come out of the grave. We, we, we've seen the sick healed. We've seen people, we, we've seen things we never thought we would see. And Jesus tells them, I have to go, but I'm sending someone to you who you will not be alone. He will help you. He will teach you. He will guide you. And Jesus was telling them about the Holy Spirit coming into their lives, the work he would do. So when in in the book of Acts, Jesus now comes and tells them, wait for me. In a few days time, the Holy Spirit, the one I've been telling you about for the last few days and weeks, he's now coming. You're about to have an encounter. You're about to receive the promise that's going to change this. There was a sense that the spirit of God was going to come upon them and they would do great things, Pastor. Mm. Great things. Wonderful. Isn't that? And it's so encouraging to know that their passion's coming from that gift of the spirit, the missional Holy Spirit. And the thing that encourages me most is this is not a one-off. When you look later in the book of Acts, we read at chapter 8, verse 4, it says the believers were scattered. So persecution comes on the church. But what's their response? They preach the good news about Jesus wherever they went. It's not a one-off. No one's forcing them to do it. It's almost a spontaneous inside out. Now, I, I know you well enough to know you love to tell people about Jesus. Any stories you can tell us from recent, recent history? Wow, I, I, I could give stories from here until thy kingdom come. Um, But, you know, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit they received is the same Spirit of God that's working in us today, Pastor. And um, we we are firm believers, my wife and I, firm believers that that God has empowered us also to go out and be a witness. And and recently, um, I got a phone call from somebody I hadn't heard from in in almost 10 years. And I was wondering, like, okay, where is this phone call going to go? And this lady was excited. And I was wondering, wow, okay. And she was sharing good news. Charles used to preach to me when we walked together. I gave my life to Jesus. And guess what, Charles? Even my daughter has given her life to Jesus. And guess what, Charles? Her husband also has given her life to Jesus. Today, they've just been baptized. Now, there's some prayers that you just look up and just say, that's God. Recently, um, I stepped out of my, my apartment my, and, my, and, and I, my neighbor wasn't feeling very well. I was wondering, what up? What's happening? What's, are you okay? He says, no, 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 no. Just, just life, 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 life. You've just fallen off the wagon. And I said, no, don't worry. Let's just be okay. Come on, encourage him a bit. And he went up to his place. Um, I got back in. Um, 
and sat down working. At about one o'clock, he knocks on my door and says, Charles, I'd like us to go out for a walk. And we go out for a walk of small, four of us. And, and we're talking and he asks one of our neighbors, how come Charles doesn't drink? He only seems happy and everything. And the neighbor was telling him, Charles goes to church. Charles loves Jesus. I, I didn't need to preach. And from that day, he's constantly reminding me just keep up with me. Keep me in your prayers. Mm. Be with me, Charles. Talk to me. And it's lovely just saying hi to him. And I want to give you a story, actually. My, my, my wife going to see a client, and, and the client was having a certain situation and, and couldn't lift his uh, left hand, yes. And, and as he was, um, one day he just lifted up his hand, and my wife turned, and suddenly out of her mouth she said, praise God. You know, the thing that you shouldn't be saying at work. And then as she said, praise God, the client said, hallelujah. <laughs> mm. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and a few days after that, we kept praying my wife that she's going to lead him to Christ. His wife had been telling my wife, come on, please, I need my husband to know God. He, he had terminal cancer. It was a bad, it was just a bad situation. And one day my wife wakes up and wakes me up at three o'clock and says, pray, we need to pray for him. We need to lead him to Christ today, today, today. And she went out, led him to Christ at 10 p.m. that day. At five in the morning, the following, that same night, she got a call that he had passed on to be with the Lord. Reach out, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, wow. Yeah, come on. Charles, last, last question. You're a busy man with a proper job. <laughs> like me. <laughs> um, how, do, how do you keep that passion? How do you sustain that sense and that desire to keep telling people about Jesus? Number one, Jesus didn't give the commandment to go and make disciples just to a select few. It's not Simon's work. It's not Galia's work. It's not Dave's work. It's not Zia's work, it's every one of us. Jesus sent you and I to go and reach out. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is for all of us. Number two, you and I will one day give an account to God for what we did here. I live life looking and asking God, will I arrive there and be embarrassed that I let you down? Or will I arrive there and you will say to me, son, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mm. Will I arrive there and he will be wondering, why did you waste your time? Mm. I want to arrive there and show him, God, we did it. Mm. And I believe you also can do the same thing. I also want to remind you something. Life group is a place we go and it encourages us to reach out. This week I had a testimony, Pastor, that blew me out. A lady was reminded by God, go back to doing acts of kindness like you used to do long ago. And so she buys flowers and gives. And one day, a lady parking by um, her car, her trolley was just next to her car. And she just turns and fills, give this lady the flowers. She gave the lady the flowers and the lady says, oh my, you don't know what. I've been feeling depressed, but now you've made my day. She prays for her. That's what happens. You go to life group, you hear testimony like that, and you want to buy flowers for everybody with a trolley <laughs> in the supermarket. Yeah, man, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Well, I'd, I'd love to carry on asking you questions, and, um, but we, we're kind of out of time. But I'm going I'm to ask Charles to do one more thing. For, ask him in a moment to pray for us. And uh, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to, to hold out your hands as a way of receiving as we come to the end of this series, we want to pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you fill me with joy and with a fresh sense of purpose? And maybe you've never prayed a prayer like that before. Maybe it's the first time you've prayed it. And just as Charles was sharing there about lives being changed when they encounter Jesus, that can happen for you today, wherever you are. So I encourage each one of us, let's, let's hold out our hands, be ready to receive. And then as Charles prays, let's believe he's going to do in us what he did in the church 2,000 years ago. So Charles, would you, would you lead us in prayer? Father, we come before you with thanksgiving. 
We ask that Jehovah God, as we've been crying out to you for the last few weeks, revive us. Revive the work of your hands. Now, Father, I pray as Paul wrote in, in, in Romans 15, verse 13, that God, you who is the fountain of our inspiration, that Father, you will fill us with joy, uncontainable joy, a joy that overflows in our families, in our workplaces, in, you know, a joy that overflows in our schools, in our universities, a joy that overflows into the nation, a joy that overflows to every area of our lives. And Father, I pray that the power of God, your power, will be resident and will work within us and will work mightily through us. We will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We will speak to situations and they will arise and turn for your glory. Father, I pray that whosoever walked in, whoever hears this, that Father, wherever they are bound by fear, they are loosed because as your joy overflows, Fear goes. Father, we decree that we are stepping into a new season of freedom, a season where joy overflows in us like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, my friend. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful word and wonderful. Those of you who've been joining us, we're going to... Um, Finish our time together. Uh, Keith's going to come and lead us in a great song. Now, this song is really a declaration of what this whole series has been about. The series is really about lifting up the name of Jesus. And as we sing this song together, no, you're not going to sing it. As we join with the band leading us in a song and we worship together, then let's make this our declaration. Jesus, be lifted up, be exalted. Let's stand together and let's worship